<laughs> Thanks again, everyone, for coming tonight in this wintry weather we're having. Um, tonight's panel is connected to our upcoming visit, Finding Our Voice, Sister Survivors Speak. Um, the flyer for the future talks in the series can be found on our reception desk back here. The exhibit was inspired by the hundreds of teal bows and ribbons that were tied around campus trees in 2018. The exhibit will give voice to the continuing struggle to heal, to challenge injustice, to demand institutional accountability, and to build a better world free of sexual assault. It is being developed through a community co-creation process with a committee of sister survivors and parents who are generously providing guidance and wisdom to the creation of the exhibit. And the exhibit will open on April 16th, so we hope to see you back during the one of the exhibits. It will go through March of the following year. Um, I'm actually going to turn things over to Grace French for just a moment to say a few words before we get into the panel discussion. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for letting me join via video in uh, you know, the company parking lot. I really appreciate that. The weather got a little bit uh, of the best of me um, through this, so I'm very grateful that I'm able to join in. I um, want to say thank you to the museum for letting um, us as an organization, the Army of Survivors, be a part of it, of this entire panel series and of the museum. Um, I think it's in really important to continue having these conversations, not only on campus, but with our community and in Detroit, and continuing to make sure that topics like these aren't avoided, brought up, and continue to be brought up, um, and that change is made. So I'm very grateful to be working uh, with the museum and with this organization moving forward. Um, so thank you guys all for coming through all of the weather. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Um, and I'd like to make everyone aware, um, if you didn't see it when you were coming in, there is a table in the back of the room um, that the Army of Survivors um, has some materials at. And also back there are some of the teal prayer flags that some of you might have seen if you've been through the museum. There's a beautiful display of them upstairs. Um, on the teal prayer flags, um, people are encouraged to share messages of support for the sister survivors, so I really encourage anyone who hasn't done so yet to, to do that as part of your visit to the museum tonight. So to shift into our panel, Understanding Consent, Legal and Ethical Perspectives on Sexuality and Sexual Violence, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom Fritz. Tom is a PhD candidate in the higher adult and lifelong education program in the College of Education here at MSU. His dissertation focuses on the lived experiences of student crisis line advocates as they interact with survivors of sexual assault and relationship violence. He is a trained bystander intervention facilitator and has worked with violence prevention as a student affairs professional for 10 years. He currently has the opportunity to serve as a member of the RBSM Experts Advisory Work Group at MSU. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and the Army of Survivors and the museum for hosting this important dialogue. As I was walking over here today and looking at the snow, I remembered when uh, my wife and I first moved here was the summer of, or the season of the bad ice storm and when the power went out and a lot of trees and limbs fell and all of this and we kind of got through it and power got restored and then snow for the rest of the season continued to fall over everything and we kind of forgot about the ice storm because the snow was there and it just started to melt more and more times we started to see that there were branches and there were down trees and there were different types of debris that were hiding underneath that snow um, I appreciated what Grace said about it's important that we continue to have these conversations as we move forward as a community and as we move forward as Michigan State, we need to not forget the things that are hidden underneath the snow. Um, I'm fortunate and honored to have the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I would like to say please practice self-care as you're listening to these speakers. Um, it is important that uh, you feel how you are feeling and if you do feel overwhelmed, please feel free to step out in the back. So. Uh, to get started, I'd like to invite Catherine Grosso, who is a professor of law with the MSU School of Law. Her research uh, focuses on the role of race in criminal law and does a lot of work with juries. So, Catherine Grosso. So, um, uh, so usually what I think about is capital punishment. 
punishment, which is kind of far from what we're talking about today. And I don't even get to teach criminal law, uh, which is where consent uh, maybe has a legal uh, meaning. But I found as I thought about what I wanted to say that in fact the first time I thought about what consent means was when I was in high school. So that was in the 1980s and then the 1980s in Virginia. And you've gotten an interesting perspective on Virginia in the news. That's the Virginia I grew up in. And where I was involved in a conversation in Loudoun County where I grew up about sex ed, about consent, about speaking and not not speaking. I talked about saying no, being powerful and saying no, and listening when girls say no. But I talked to my daughter, who's a high schooler here in this area. She's been both in Okemos and in East Lansing, where she is now. And no one has ever talked to her in the high school context about any of this stuff. And that's insane. It's been a long time since I graduated high school. So here are the things that I want to say to you all. I'm so glad I had a chance to say these things to you all. First of all, I speak to you as a survivor of the kind of experience to which there can be no consent. I am a survivor of child sex abuse. I was an elementary school kid. And nothing I could say or think or want could make that consent valid. It didn't matter if I wanted attention, if I wanted to be loved, if I wanted to be special. None of that matters. Nothing I could say or do makes that a valid consent. That tells you a starting place, right? Consent has context, and the context matters. So it was really interesting. I said to my sibs, I come from a big pack of kids, uh, and uh, uh, I said, what do, what do we know? What do we teach each other about consent outside of the law? And I have, I have one brother who's a dentist. And he said to me, well, you know, consent to me in the medical consent situation is about the equality of the conversation between the patient and me. If my patient doesn't understand exactly what I plan to do, like he cleans teeth and fix bowlers, you know, things like that, then we can't go forward. Consent is something basic between equal relationships. I thought about what I know myself. So consent is a powerful thing. I teach the law of police investigations. Uh, and in, the context, in that context, if a police officer asks for your consent and you say you can search my house, done. The Constitution is out of it. Until the time that you say, stop. So if I think about the lowest kind of consent, that kind, we know that it has to be free and voluntary. If anybody's pushing anybody about consent, including just the police or your doctor, uh, then it's gone, it's useless, it's not consent, it doesn't exist. So free and voluntary. And the other piece that's absolutely always true is that you can revoke it. So at any point, I can say to all the police in the world, stop looking. And they have to stop unless they can get another way to come in. Right? Another reason, right? A reason to search my house on other grounds. But my consent controls. You may search my house, my body, my purse, as long as I say so. And when I say stop, you have to stop. So these are the easy kinds of consent. I have another brother. I have a lot of brothers, so we won't go through all of them. My brother is a city councilor in Washington, D.C. And the work he's been doing in the past couple years has been about teaching and making consent important in the educational process in Washington, D.C. to keep the children safe. He's the chair of the education committee. And I said to him, tell me what you're thinking about. Tell me what you're hearing about consent. So he sent me a 500-page document from the hearings he's had. But he also sent me his policy, uh, which I think s says, uh, talks about another kind of consent that I think is uh, worthwhile. Let's see if I can see it here. He says, this is his office policy. But it's one he wrote out of all of this conversation and all of the amazing uh, people in his office uh, who would think wisely. Consent is positive, unambiguous, and voluntary. It's an agreement to engage in specific activity throughout an encounter. Consent should not be inferred from the absence of a no. Consent to some activity does not constitute consent to others, nor does past consent to a given activity constitute present or future consent. Consent cannot be revoked at any time, or can be revoked at any time, and cannot be obtained by threat, coercion, or force. Consent cannot be obtained from someone who is asleep or otherwise incapacitated. 
whether mentally or physically, whether due to alcohol, drugs, or some other condition. Engaging in sexual activity with a person whom you know, or reasonably should know, to be incapacitated constitutes sexual misconduct as defined in this policy. So that sets it out pretty well, right? Part, many, many of the uh, barrier, many, many of the ways that consent gets more complicated. We require higher and better consent. When we're talking about intimacy of any kind, we're talking about relations between humans, not with your doctor or your police officer, with all respect to the police officer. <laughs> Uh, I thought there's one other piece that, that to me informs this other kind of uh, consent, this higher consent. And it gets back to the first thing I said uh, about what is impossible for consent. And that is that right relationships matter. In consent, where there's power imbalance, I doubt it. Right? I doubt the consent. So here on campus, where there are lots of complicated relationships, and people say consent may be hard, that's when enthusiastic consent is a good idea. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Are you comfortable with what I'm doing? And the ability and freedom to say no. So uh, a truly respectful relationship of equals in which each person is and feels respected and totally free to express themselves <laughs> honestly and without reservations Power in a consensual relationship cannot be unequal by virtue of cultural practices, position, professional relationships, education, or even personality. A relationship built on consent cannot be manipulative or abusive in any way, physical, verbally, or psychologically. So all that long thing says to me is that it has to be free and voluntary, but that context matters. And the very last thing, what you're consenting to matters. Right? Context matters not where you're standing, but what you're thinking about. And some of that comes from law and some of it from life. Thank you. Our, uh, our next panelist is actually embodying what it means to hold many hats on campus. So um, Kat uh, Ebert is our next speaker, and she's going to speak and then has to go represent her organization for funding through ASMSU, and then we'll return back. So any questions that you have for her, we'll give when she returns. So um, Kat is a sister survivor currently attending MSU to receive her Bachelor of Science degree in Neuroscience with a Pharmacology and Toxicology minor. She's a volunteer for the Army of Survivors, as well as a board member for the new 24-7 Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner program on campus. Kat is also the president of the MSU chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which is an organization that promotes harm reduction, peer drug education, and policy reform. Kat hopes to one day receive her DO and PhD in neuropsychopharmacology, did I say that right? to research and administer effective treatment for PTSD, anxiety, and depression, specifically for survivors and veterans. Kat. Okay, so I have to be quick because I have to go to this other appointment, which I diligently tried to reschedule. <laughs> but, um, so my name's Kat, and I'm a student here, and consent to me, well, consent is, you know, you want to do something. And sorry, I'm just kind of winging this right now. But um, consent is that you want to do something. So you are, you know, agreeing with another person that you want to perform an action or be involved in something. And it's not just about, consent is not just about sex. Consent is about everything. Um, you know, you don't want to, let's say, uh, so for example, let's say you have a meeting with a bunch of really important people. And if you don't want to do that and you don't give your consent, but you still have to go, it still feels kind of weird, which is a, it's a, it's a lengthy analogy, I apologize. But no means no. And there's no, there's no education in terms of that. When I spoke last year in court, something I mentioned was, you know, we need to educate the younger generations um, in our society because as children, you don't necessarily know what's wrong and what's right. And you're supposed to trust the people that, you know, your elders, the people that you look up to, the people that tell you what to do on a daily basis. 
And for there to not, I never had any kind of consent training in all of my education until this past year, MSU finally released a, an online program about consent, which I know for a fact, majority of the campus, which everyone was required to take, majority of the campus just, you know, skipped through it and let the videos play while they did something else. So, in terms of understanding consent and to understand consent better as a society, we need to all come together and have, you know, you start consent training in, let's say, first grade. Right when you learn here, right when you learn how to read, you start learning about consent. No means no, what's okay, what's not okay, and you know, teaching children of our generation, because if we start at the beginning, then they can only go up from there. But it's very hard to start, you know, somewhere down the line, maybe in the middle of your life, or even for college students, especially for college students, to say, this is what consent is, and this is what consent isn't. There's a lot of blurred lines in college, a lot of drinking and substance use, and. There's a lot of blurred lines where you're not necessarily told this is okay and this isn't okay. And it's fine, it's great that we're starting to teach college students and other members of society about what consent really is, but it really needs to start at the beginning. And I apologize that was kind of scatterbrained, and I'm so sorry that I have to leave, but I will be back. <laughs> Um, next, I'd like to invite our uh, our virtual participants, and I think we can actually have you see us. Hey. Oh, hi. 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 <laughs> uh, Kimberly Hurst is the founder and executive director of the WC Safe Program, Detroit and Wayne County's only comprehensive sexual assault center. Kimberly is a proud MSU alumna and was very involved in the athletic department while here at MSU as a student athletic trainer. She graduated from here in 1991 and went on for a master's in kinesiology from the University of Minnesota and a second master's in physician assistant studies from Wayne State University. She has been a board certified physician assistant working in emergency medicine as well as a sexual assault forensic examiner for 18 years. Kimberly Hurst. Michigan 
is I uh, teach to law enforcement and prosecutors around how to engage with sexual assault survivors, understanding more about the medical forensic process, understanding what being trauma-informed is and how to support their victims rather than victim blame. But that consent piece is something that we talk very, very much about because understanding what consent means and the whole, the whole purpose of why we're here tonight is to, to have some discussion around what consent means because the things that we reiterate and, and the, the two, my two panelists that spoke before me were, were very eloquent and said some amazing things that I would absolutely echo and support. But you know, some of the things that are, um, people don't understand is if, if, if there is a situation where fear is in the room, then consent is not, right? Like when you talk about um, giving consent and then this, the whole concept of what affirmative consent looks like, but, but anytime there's fear in the room, regardless of whether a yes is said, consent is not in the room. And we do a lot of talking about what, what can consent look like? We do a lot about, well, showing parallel situations from the standpoint of consent sometimes is not verbal. Sometimes consent is nonverbal. It could be in um, something as simple as pushing someone's hand away. We use an example a lot of the time where, you know, when you're on an airplane and you have Jack Kathy next to you and you really don't want to talk, you really would just like to, I don't know, watch your Netflix or read a book. How do you convey consent? What are different ways that you can convey, like leave me alone, I'm not interested. So we go through those different types of scenarios and different ways that consent can look without it necessarily even being verbal. So the, the, the fact that we now have to get to the point where um, consent has to be either a yes or a no is really unfortunate. And the fact that perpetrators of sexual violence were never looking for consent to begin with. So, you know, even, even when there is that challenge around that piece, perpetrators weren't going to ask, ask. <laughs> perpetrators were going to just do what they came there to do. And so those are just some of the considerations that I'll be thinking about as we move forward with tonight's discussion. And again, I'm really thankful, thankful for you guys to come out in this weather also, and I'm excited to hear from the other panelists. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Kimberly. Louise Harder is a sister survivor currently living in Lansing. She is the strategist and a founding board member for the Army of Survivors. Louise is a daughter, sister, former diver, and public health educator. She uses her platform to advocate for other survivors. Louise. Um, I apologize in advance, this is what happens when you go to what for, um, and everybody shares all of your notes. Or already says, like, three quarters of your notes, so that's, that's fabulous. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, as I was thinking about this topic of consent, I thought it was important to reflect back a little bit on my past. Um, and similarly, I uh, remember the first time I, I started out, um, K-12, I actually, I was in Michigan public schools, so I had the um, sexual education, or sexual health education um, curriculum that was standard among public schools. And I remember no means no. Um, it was simple, it was an easy phrase to remember. Uh, it's pretty straightforward um, at the time. Uh, but looking back, I, I think it did, um, a huge disservice to us, uh, keeping it at just no means no. Because um, then you start to think about what happens when drugs or alcohol are involved. What happens when a person is physically threatened? Um, if, if a gun is to my head, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say don't shoot me. Like, okay. Um, or what if there's just a perceived threat? Uh, like they were saying, if, if fear is there, um, there's a perceived threat and no can't be um, given at that time. What if there are minors involved? Or there's a power dynamic? Uh, doctor and patient, for instance. Um, what if consent wasn't even asked? So um, I also went back. I first saw Larry when I was 16. Um, and I, um, he told me that if I continued to work with him, he would fix me and all would be good. I could continue diving. It's the story we've heard multiple times over the last year. Um, 
I think it's also important to know that, typical of other serial predators, Larry didn't ask for consent, but after at, being told to after being told to wear gloves, he didn't do that either. Like, I don't think that was going to happen. Um, and it, this wasn't a matter of that, but I think it was a huge turning point for me. And it was afterward, after seeing him, I think it was even more important for me to have that consent and have that affirmative consent. Because um, I found through that, my consent is my power, it's my control, and it's my autonomy. Um, and after seeing Larry, I pushed away from touch quite a bit. Um, I think this was especially hard for my parents because they really struggled to understand why their daughter didn't want to be helped at the worst point of her life. Um, sorry. So it took a while, but I think what we came from that is now my parents now ask me, like, is it okay for a hug or to rub my shoulders when I'm tense and um, have that stress? We now ask each other before that. Um, and I think that's that form of consent that I think has been very important for me. Uh, and it's, it's kind of where we started. I, I started that discussion of trying to figure out what is consent for me um, and, and how, do I, how do I talk about it? So back to the no means no piece. The problem with that is it's, consent is so much more than just no means no. Um, that's not enough. It's, it's more of a mutual, enthusiastic yes that can change at any point. Um, so one of my favorite examples of this is the T consent video on YouTube. And I think we're able to pull it up. Oh, some people have seen it. Is it this one right here? Perfect. Um, and, oh, and for those of you who want to see it at some other point, there is a clean and explicit version. So just a warning, if you don't like that. <laughs> if you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. <laughs> then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. <laughs> Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please. That's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone all the effort of making the tea. But they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the meat. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And if they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, 
I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, it was funny, but it starts to, it, I think it opens up the conversation to begin um, to talk about it. And I first saw it as part of my student affairs training. Um, I was over at Oakland University. And uh, at the time, I decided to be a public health um, educator. And so I was kind of with that background and with my experience, um, they thought it'd be a great idea. And I was actually on board with it. But um, they had me help uh, co-lead some of the discussion on what a healthy relationship was in the sexual education program um, over at OU. And um, I usually share that video as kind of a way to open up the conversation and kind of start talking about it. Uh, usually, at some point, somebody would ask, like, do you seriously stop and ask somebody for consent? And I think, I mean, there are nonverbal cues, um, for sure, and we talked about that. So, so maybe not um, necessarily verbally. You stop and, like, make it an awkward conversation. But you have that nonverbal, or you know you have that relationship or that um, conversation at some point. Uh, for me, it's actually important. Um, I, I find, I, I have my boyfriend watch the tea video. Um, that's just who I am. We have that conversation regularly about touch um, and any form of consent. Uh, there are times he asks, he knows um, if he's going to be up behind me, I can't be hugged from behind. He usually waves a hand in the side, make sure I know it's him, and then he'll ask me. Nine times out of ten, it's fine. But that one time out of ten, it may not be. So um, we just have that relationship. And so I think it's, it's trying to figure out what works for you. Um, and it, it can always be changing. So, so to continue having that conversation, I think is really important. So I did want to end with the idea that we teach uh, consent through uh, both our actions, the nonverbal cues, the verbal cues, um, and our conversations. Um, I think a lot of, or some of us know, like when we go to grandma's, we have to hug her um, as a child. And growing up, I, I think that's well, well meaning. Um, it's starting to teach that or take away that power. Um, and that control for a, a child to decide for themselves. So maybe moving forward, we ask, hey, you want to give a hug, uh, a high five, or even just a wave, you know, like allow them to choose and make that choice. Um, I think it's also important uh, to talk about gender rules and take that down. The man does not always have to ask. That should go both ways. Uh, I think it's also important to know that a marriage certificate does not mean automatic consent for life. Um, we, start need to, we need to start changing that conversation, too. Um, and I think it, it, uh, affirmative consent is helpful, that enthusiastic yes, instead of just the no means no, open up the conversation to a little bit more on what that means for each person. Uh, and lastly, I think we need to start talking about it more. So. Thank you all for coming in the nasty weather and joining us to begin that conversation. Thank you, Louise. Our last panelist is Dr. Megan Moss. Dr. Megan Moss is an assistant professor of human development and family studies at Michigan State University. Her work is focused on adolescent sexual socialization with an emphasis on the online context as a new sex education and space for facilitating sexual harassment. Her research goal is to develop parent and school-based curriculum to create positive school climates to prevent sexual assault and harassment. Dr. Moss. Woo! Yes, Dr. Moss. Again, I guess being one of the last speakers, some of these ideas have already been shared, but um, but I will just you know reiterate them. So um, there are three aspects of consent that I really would like to focus on tonight that inspire my work. Uh, the first is that perceptions of consent occur far before an actual sexual interaction occurs, a face-to-face -face sexual event. So for instance, in my research, there are many indications that particularly among young people, online interactions via texting, sexting, dating app usage, uh, social media usage, 
are indicators to young people of consent. Um, the second is that we want, if we do want to prevent sexual assault in college, which I'm sure all of us here do, we have to begin um, educating young people about consent in elementary school. And third, that I am both a little bit fearful but also excited about um, the fact that young people might only be engaged in consent education if it's as fun and sexy as porn is. So we have to make consent sexy. So going back to my first um, point, so one of the findings of my dissertation was that female adolescents who presented themselves in provocative ways online and who engaged in sexting were twice as likely to be sexually assaulted one year later than female adolescents who didn't. Sounds pretty victim blamey, right? We don't want to do that. Of course, whatever you do online is not going to cause you to be sexually assaulted. Um, but we do know that male perpetrators of sexual assault will often seek out minor females who are displaying themselves provocatively online or who are giving other indicators of vulnerability. So that could explain part of that finding. Um, but it doesn't necessarily explain the face-to-face, peer-to-peer sexual assault that's occurring as well. And so my lab, um, we are, in the next few months, going to be uh, conducting focus groups with uh, college students to determine if young people, particularly women, feel obligated to engage in sexual behavior, if they've been flirting online or engaged in sexting, and if people feel, particularly boys and young men, that they are entitled to that sexual behavior if somebody sends them a nude photo or is flirting with them. Um, online. And then this is, of course, in the hopes to inform education that young people know that it doesn't matter what happens online, it's never a guarantee or an obligation for offline sexual behavior. Um, the second point, which has been said, you know, many times before, um, for those of us who work in sexual assault prevention on campus, which is something I did um, for years before coming to academia, we know that it doesn't really matter how much education there is in the second, first, third year of college when people are just clicking through it and ignoring it. In order to really prevent sexual assault, we have to prevent it in high school and middle school. And the only way we can do that is if we begin consent education in kindergarten. And I know this now more than ever as not only a researcher, but as a, as a mother of my own children, I know that it is possible to teach um, young people consent. In my professional work, I've worked with dozens of schools on their sexual misconduct policies uh, to incorporate content and um, reaction to sexting and online sexual harassment in high school and middle school. And one of the main themes that I've really witnessed over and over and over again is this really uh, ignorant, if not negligent, um, perspective on gender socialization and gender inequality. If you have teachers that can't even intervene when boys won't let a girl play dinosaurs with them because girls don't play dinosaurs, we cannot expect older people to be able to intervene when their friends are sexually assaulting or sexually harassing somebody else. Um, and then lastly, it might be a controversial subject, and it's not to um, excuse any sexual violence or any lack of understanding of consent that's occurring, but um, sexual violence prevention and education efforts are competing with internet porn. So the, this, coupled with the fact that engagement in any prevention program, any education program, actually liking the program, is one of the number one factors of whether or not that program will be effective. And so if we have the young people who think this programming is boring, that it's not relevant, that they know sex is not tea, why are you showing me a video about tea? I'm not going to be making somebody have sex. I'm not making them do it. She was drunk, she was dancing, she was flirting with me, we were kissing. Like this is, you know, they need more information. And in order to have more information, we have to be able to talk about sexual behaviors and body parts. We have to talk about oral sex. We have to talk about penises and vulvas and sexual pleasure and orgasm. And being able to give young people that vocabulary to talk about the sexual behaviors that they want to engage in and the sexual behaviors they don't want to engage in. 
Because unfortunately, no means no is not enough. We know that, right? Because that's been happening for decades. We wish it was. And unfortunately, now there's, there's indicators that the yes means yes isn't enough either. We need um, more comprehensive education than that if we truly want to, to gain the attention of today's internet porn saturated youth. So on that note, <laughs> um, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions in regard, regards to that. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite our panelists up to the front so we can take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, as they are moving forward, I would ask um, for accessibility services. If there are people asking questions from the audience, please use the microphone toward the middle of the, the crowd here. Um, I will move my microphone over to the panel uh, as we need this for them to make sure that they are being heard. So, um, what questions can the panel ask? Answer me. been wondering at the museum about what it means to create a consent-based campus culture in so many ways because I think we're all, I mean on the faculty and everybody else, we're so aware of what it means to have been at an institution that for decades has undercut the basic principles of, of course, accountability, responsibility, and transparency, um, and has in, in fundamental ways undercut the autonomy of, and the rights we know of, of sister survivors and others. And, and that's been so corrosive, and so we keep on asking, well, how do we move, how do we sort of find our way back to basic humanity? And in a very small way, the project of, the, of, of this museum, the exhibition, has been in that spirit. Even a year ago, as we were looking at those amazing teal bows and ribbons across, uh, across campus, we kept thinking, well, we so badly want to protect these, we're a museum, we, we want to honor these. We knew it wasn't on us just to go and take them down without anyone's consent. And, and, and then, even once there was a crisis and we were able to enter into a conversation with, with POSIC, with the parents, with, the, with allies and survivors, it was a sort of gradual process of figuring out step by step uh, how to preserve uh, the ribbons, and then exploring in each step of this very difficult and challenging process of trying to develop an exhibition together, um, which so many of us in this room have been part of. And, and almost every day we find ourselves asking, well, what, what does the museum team have the right to do? Uh, how do we create a blueprint for uh, producing right here a culture of mutual understanding and profound co-equal respect? Uh, this is something that Judy Walgren has been working with, very concerned about the politics of images, that so many survivors have pointed out that their images have been taken often by male photographers and circulated without their consent. Um, and, and Judy's been exploring with now, I think, up to about 20 survivors, their own self-portrait project in which they're consenting to determine how they should be represented. And I'm just wondering thoughts on that spirit. How do we move outside the walls of a museum to create a, a campus culture and a global national and world culture that, rec that really recognizes that consent is fundamental to any understanding of human rights and creating a, a truly human, humane community, which here on this campus we seem to have lost for so long. I, I really think it starts with right relationships. I think it starts with the patriarchy, to be honest. And I think it starts with recognizing that uh, women have voices and agency. And I think it's partly not asking your children to hug their grandparents, but I think more importantly, it's listening to your children. 
So not agreeing with them. My daughter would say she lives in a very strict and inflexible world. But I do listen, and I do change my mind when she makes sense. And I allow her to push me around when she has a, a point to make. If that means that we have pickles with dinner, fine. If it means she stays up an hour later, fine. This is something that you practice, that it's, it's Montessorian. It's the way Montessori education started when um, Maria Montessori was trying to stop war. But it changes the power dynamic, and that's what it takes. So on this campus, it takes um, electing people to the board who will speak clearly and will change the president. I agree, thank you. Um, I also think it's an ongoing conversation. Um, it, it's opening up, like you said, the, the relationship and having that ongoing dialogue um, and ever evolving and, and figuring out um, what both people feel comfortable with. Um, it's, it, it, it's trying, it, it's recognizing the um, power dynamics at play um, and trying to adjust to make it a more even playing field, if it ever um, possible. Um, if that's, you know, um, even even height um, and how that is, um, it it's, I think, being more cognizant um, and more aware of, of what's going on. Uh, I, I thank you for your concerns and your, um, pursuit of, of justice with the museum. Uh, even the only thing that sort of came to mind as like a specific action that could be taken is, and, I, and I'm blanking on um, specifics right now, but there are many um, artists and activists, um, you know, at least maybe locally here, um, you know, or in Detroit or Chicago, people that um, would really appreciate, you know, a, a featured show or an event of some sort that, and you know, female uh, artists who really focus on this kind of a thing. Something perhaps we could also do in addition to sort of, you know, raise the consciousness here. Kimberly, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was sitting here thinking, okay, this is, this is the hard part because I can't see my panelists, so yeah, I'll just, by the fact, I'll always go last if I have anything to say. Because, but, <laughs> no, but I agree with everything that my colleagues have said, but the other thing, I think, you know, we can, we can talk about consent and we need to be talking about consent. But the other side of this is that if, again, kind of going back to one of the points I made initially, is perpetrators never intend to get consent. And if we're not holding perpetrators accountable, then this problem is going to continue, regardless of the discussions around consent. And so the, the challenge that we've had, not just in situations like with Larry Nassar, but with, with countless other sex offenders, whether they're people in... Uh, whether it is somebody who's well known, or whether it's not, is the fact that the rates of actual accountability of these perpetrators is so low, we need to really be ashamed of ourselves. Because until, until, um, until law enforcement, until the criminal justice system, until we as a community really are willing to hold offenders accountable, this is going to continue. And so having those discussions, I think, is or, or keeping in mind that that is an important piece of this as well, because it doesn't it, in, in cases where you say yes, you say no, you, you have nonverbal cues. That perpetrator isn't going to care, and and so it, that is a huge piece of this discussion as well. And obviously, one of the reasons we're here today is because there was not accountability um, with regards to what Larry Nassar was doing and what countless other perpetrators have done, are doing, will do. And so really, um, as, uh, as, as we continue to have these discussions, that's what really needs to be happening. And consent is part of that. Realizing what victim blaming looks like, really realizing really what that rape culture piece does, that's why all of this um, continues to happen. So these discussions, this is one of the ways. You talk about how are we going to do this on campus. This is one of the ways that we do this on campus. Question. Questions from the audience? Or comments. Or comments. I actually have um, 
So I have a concern that I don't really know what to do with um, as a scholar, but just as a person. Um, I was at Penn State when uh, the Jerry Sandusky um, crimes came out, um, and then come here with Nassar. <laughs> yes. um, and all the while, you know, I'm a certified sex educator, and uh, I'm in sexual assault prevention, and then I'm in academia, you know, researching um, adolescent sexuality and sex education. And, um, I, and I know that we have to acknowledge that perpetrators you know, are not going to care about consent. And we do need to hold perpetrators accountable, particularly heinous, horrific, horrible perpetrators, I mean, these evil people. But at the same time, we have a tendency to do this, oh, well, these, pe these evil, horrible, horrible perpetrators you know, that come out and get all the press that they're the ones we're all looking out for. Mm -hmm. And that all these other ones who might just have one or two victims, who might, um, might be more sexually coercive than they are violent, um, and be doing just as, I mean, maybe not just as much harm, but are certainly harming people enough that should be stopped. That I worry that, um, that some of our education efforts get a little muddied, or that people turn a blind eye because they think, oh, well, he wasn't holding a gun to her head, or you know, he wasn't doing this to hundreds of people like these other perpetrators. So maybe it's not that big a deal, and they turn the other cheek to go away. So, um, I, although it, so, I do think it's important to to highlight perpetrator behavior. I think it's also important to recognize that they're. There is a spectrum in some, in some ways as well, and young people in particular need to be able to hold, you know, and boys in particular need to be able to hold male friends accountable who are, you know, doing some of these, what we would consider to be lesser horrific sexual crimes. <coughs> That's why, that's why fun sex ed and fun is really necessary, right? The thing that people want to watch and think about, about the relationship and about what you say to a friend who's um, treating another person that way, right? Which they don't have, we don't have, we don't do. So fun is good. Well, and uh, Catherine, I'd actually ask, you know, you talked about how uh, the patriarchy pops up, <laughs> sexual violence and, and that kind of thing. So how, I think getting to, to Megan's point about systems and how we're really good at pointing predators out, but how are we kind of, how do these systems point them out? So how do we talk about dismantling systems that prop up these perpetrators and sexual violence? This is the million dollar question, so. <laughs> With the magic wand, clearly. <laughs> I, I do think by naming harm, I think that by not saying it's okay, by not letting, uh, um, cr crime is one thing, right? We have to prosecute crimes, but we also want the behavior not to happen. We want an unwanted kiss. When we don't want the kiss, we don't want the kiss. And I think we, that it starts by talking about it and by teaching about it, that, um, that I have agency over my body. So you can touch me or not, if I say so. I don't know. I don't know. You guys say so. <laughs> I think it also goes in, it goes back to believing survivors and listening to survivors because um, there is there is a huge spectrum um, it's not an extreme um, in a lot of cases um, and those people and their story matter too um, so it's recognizing that um, I think it's also realizing that, I, I go back to the um, statistic um, that uh, in the, the graphic that's on the RAIN website um, shows it really well, but it's like out of the thousand perpetrators, very few actually get a convicted sentence. There's two to eight percent, depending on the study, number of false reports. Um, if, if you look at those statistics, I think that helps paint or start to kind of open up that um, and look at that, that wouldn't be possible if, if there weren't that that range. So I think it's it's talking and and I I guess I hope 
with the Me Too movement, with the change, with, with some people starting to come forward, that more will start to come forward and share their stories and that they're believed as well. Because I think that's kind of how it happens too, is by um, normalizing the, um, or not normalizing, but um, it, allowing survivors to talk about it and giving them that space to do so. So I wanted to comment on when you um, said that you think it starts with tackling the issue of patriarchy. I think one of the big problems in our society is I completely agree with you on um, you know that I think we, we have to address the patri patriarchy. Um, we have to talk about toxic masculinity um, and gender inequality and all those things. But how do you how do we mainstream these these ideas? Because I think that that kind of vocabulary seems like something that you only get in like an academic context. They kind of sound like um, elitist terms, and that, and that they're not talked about outside of it. And there's it just seems like. Um, it's hard to even have a conversation about because look at the Gillette ad. I, I mean, just that word toxic masculinity is like half the country couldn't even hear what the message was because all they heard was, oh, they're just saying all men are bad. <laughs> and that drives me crazy. And so how do you think um, that we can make these, main, these viewpoints more mainstream? And Because I really don't think they are fringe. Um, one thing I think about is I know when people, or when, uh, before marriage equality became the law, um, I heard some people talking on TV or something <laughs> about how it helped, or, or when, when people were asked what they thought about gay marriage, a lot of people said, oh, I don't know about gay marriage, so proponents started calling it marriage equality. And, pe and people thought, oh, marriage equality, yeah, equality, that sounds like a good thing, so do you think, um, Maybe we, we need to adapt the language to um, <laughs> to appeal to like the lower common denominator to mainstream it in society. Mm -hmm. Would you like just keep getting punched into to you? So we know that most men are not rapists, right? Most men don't sexually assault. And a lot of what happens with this discussion, because 90 plus percent of perpetrators, 98 percent of perpetrators are male, that that, that gets discussed out there, right? And so part of what we've been trying and, and attempting to do, as well as a lot of other agencies and other programs that doing this work, is calling men in rather than calling men, rather than calling men out, right? So when we talk about bystander awareness, we can we can name that bystander awareness absolutely, but really what we're trying to do is call men into the discussion and say, look, we know that not all men are rapists, not all men are going to sexually assault, but we do rely on men to help put out there what what should they be doing or what is not okay. And when it comes to that that toxic masculinity term, um, it's, it is a term that I think a lot of men hear and they're automatically turned off by because of just the, the whole idea of being masculine is still there. You can still be masculine and not necessarily be toxic, right? So what does that look like? And so I think you know you have some good ideas around we just change the language, but I think really it has to do more with changing the overall discussion and having men in the, in, in the audience. And so as I'm looking, I see we have a lot of men in this room, and I really applaud that you guys are here that you're willing to have this discussion. Because it can be really tough to be part of this discussion as a man. I, I have two young boys, they're 9 and 10. When we started this discussion, probably before they would remember it, like they just three and four. We started this discussion of what's question in our school district that we have um, prevention programs that come in as early as kindergarten to talk about these things. Um, and so I think to your point, um, However that looks, whether it's just a matter of having more discussion and involving men more in this discussion around what they're feeling, what they're feeling, 
what they think would be helpful, um, and letting them know that like we realize that not all men do this, and that and that men realize that it's not okay to be doing this. Um, and so again, that that whole calling men in versus calling men out, I guess, is sort of the the things that come to my mind as we have this discussion. So, uh, Dr. McCauley, who's in the audience, and I have had these conversations quite a bit because she was absolutely integral in, in developing programming that calls upon um, boys and men to change, you know, the, the conversations around how to treat women and, and conversations about what does masculinity mean and that using, harnessing your masculinity, I mean, I mean, honestly, Active bystander intervention, which is one of the most effective interventions for preventing sexual assault, is really using your power to stop another individual or to uh, intervene in a situation to protect someone. So why aren't we packaging that as being an awesome man and being masculine and really being like a superhero? Because it's kind of like what you're doing. You're sort of being a superhero. Um, but then, intellectually, we get in these conversations like, but then you're fighting patriarchy with more patriarchy, <laughs> so <laughs> is that going to actually do anything? Um, but I do think it's a fair point, especially as somebody who has taught sex education in high schools and who teaches human sexuality to, to college students here on campus. I know that as soon as I lose, as soon as I lose my male students, I know, I know it, and I have to try really hard to get them back and, and to say something else to keep them engaged, because I know that they are the ones that hold a lot of the power to prevent at least some of the stuff that's occurring on campus. Um, so yeah, may, I think making the conversation accessible to people, you know, um, even people who identify as, as masculine is important. Well, oh, quickly, um, and I don't want to steal um, her thunder, but Brenda Tracy talks a little bit about this, and I'm not going to do it justice because she's amazing, um, but she's an amazing activist, and she talks a lot about how um, men are the solution, and she goes in and talks to men specifically, and I just have that kind of on repeat in the back of my mind as you guys are talking about it. Um, She's like, if women would have, could have done it on their own, they would have done it 50 years ago, and it would have been done. Um, so, so talking about that and setting that expectation and being part of that 90%, she's, she's a very firm believer of that. So I think that's part of it, too. I was just going to comment on what Dr. Moss was saying. So I'm Heather McCauley. I'm a sexual violence researcher here um, at Michigan State. And bystander intervention actually came out of the critique of sexual violence prevention efforts that um, that that it was too individually uh, blaming, and people in the audience were kind of tuning out because they're like, "That's not me. I haven't assaulted anyone," and they kind of tune out. So that's really where the bystander intervention movement in sexual violence prevention came from. And so what Dr. Moss was referring to is our work with um, the Coaching Boys into Men <coughs> program um, that was developed by Futures Without Violence, and I was uh, an evaluator for the program, which really taps into opinion leaders and identifying who those opinion leaders are on campuses um, to shift these norms around masculinity. But it is fighting patriarchy with patriarchy. Um, we know that, and there's, there's still a long way to go. Our, our teams um, in human development and family studies, our students are actually Doing work published a paper on how um, how masculinity and, and men are engaging in the Me Too movement online on Twitter. So I think um, social media is a really interesting place to be engaging um, men in the conversation as well. Hi, so um, this this line of thinking about patriarchy, patriarchy. Um, I wanted to ask a question and then I had a couple of comments about um, your, uh, I, you know, your sort of proposal that we need to make um, uh, sort of our training sexy like porn and I wanted to like, I was like, okay, I, I, I'm in, really interested in that idea but I'm sort of unclear, um, maybe being someone from before the internet porn explosion. So, um, but also, um, I thought it was really interesting to think about the way these are all sort of intertwined because it's sort of, we, we're talking both about sort of sexual physical consent, 
Um, and then, uh, Catherine, you sort of raised this point about, and you were drawing this point about the university and campus, um, and then we sort of thinking more broadly as well, and it just made me think of a couple of things. So, Catherine, your comment um, about the president made me realize this is one of the things that really annoys me about the presidential search, right? If you think about the cup of tea, it's like, yeah, like, you know, last week we asked for your consent and we got all your input on the presidential search, and now we're just going to close it off or we're not going to ask for your consent ever again. Um, and the organization that I'm involved in, Reclaim, actually says we should have the, the um, you know, the academic Congress should be able to reject a candidate that we don't want. Um, and I think that I haven't sort of put this into this context yet of like, this is consent, right? Um, but also, uh, as a historian, I, I'm teaching at the moment about settler colonialism, and I had not thought of it in this terms as well, but essentially I've always been a little um, uncomfortable with the land acknowledgement. Um, I think it's really important, it's really important to draw that forward and to show it, but and I couldn't understand why did this make me uncomfortable, and I'm sorry we use some rude language here, but essentially what it's saying is, we're really sorry, we know we're on Native American land, and we fucked you. Um, and that's like this whole country, right? We're talking about patriarchy, it's a whole country, and probably most of us, I'm not suggesting all of us, but probably most of us are every day living that violation of consent. And that's a really difficult thing to wrestle with, I think. So I just, yeah, I wanted to, but I'm very, also very interested in the porn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to geek out sometime about why um, why Americans are just incredibly violent and why we do have so much sexual assault and, and some people do liken that to slavery and, mm -hmm. and the fact that we took over Native American land. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of seem to be that way as a people, and that's perhaps some of why we are, one of the reasons why we might be so violent. But um, but yeah, I know it's, an, it's sort of an extreme idea to talk about, you know, let's try to make consent education as great as, and fun as porn is or something. And I'm, I'm, trust me, I've got lots of problems with porn, so. Um, but the fact is, is that young people are so inundated with internet porn, I mean, and that, and with the lack of sex education, that's where they go to. And so if we're trying to reach out to them, we have to be kind of realistic. So there are some grassroots efforts of sex educators sort of creating these consent um, workshops to sort of teach people kind of how to talk dirty and in a way that's like, hey, I really want to do this to you, or I love it if you would do this to me, or, um, you know, really being able to just I mean, and one of the things I have my um, human sexuality class do is we all say like penis and vagina really loud <laughs> and as a group and um, because so many people are afraid to say those words. I know I was until I was like 25. <laughs> um, and so uh, being able to give people the language, I guess, and more, you know, concrete examples because they're like, am I really supposed to say, like, here's a list of everything I'd like to do, can we check off on all of that and then we're good? I mean, that's a turn off. And, you know, part of sex being exciting is that it's mysterious and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Um, but that's where trust and mutual respect comes into play. And, um, and really, and really valuing women's pleasure and, and valuing their experiences, and then listening and believing them when they say that they did not enjoy an experience. Um, so I think, you know, and to Keaton's point, um, perhaps that's one way we can also mainstream the conversation about consent is by making it um, a little bit more fun and a little bit more um, practical. But not necessarily like visual form. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about this right after I left, and I was like, "Oh, I should have said it." So, um, something that I have a huge problem with, and I think that a lot of people do that they don't necessarily consciously think about, is the way kind of to go with what you said. Um, 
The way that sex is portrayed in movies, especially, and in the media, um, you know, there's never, like, a time of consent. There's never a time where it's like, hey, yes. There's always just a, it happens, and girls thrown up against the wall, and stuff like that. And that's such a, the media and the internet and everything, like, like porn, everything is so... You know, the young people of our society today, they're always just glued to their phones. And um, it's weird to say that I'm one of the last generations that grew up, grew up without cell phones. Um, and it's such a, you know, like, that's how it's portrayed in movies and media. And it makes it uncomfortable to be like, hey, um, I would like to, I would like for you to ask for my consent, which, like you said, is a turnoff a lot of the time. But, um, so I guess, yeah, just the way that it's portrayed in media, I think, needs to change as well, because there should be, you know, in movies, a point, or movies and, you know, videos and whatever, a point where there is clearly a boundary set and clearly a consensual yes or no, I'm not comfortable with that instead of just a whirlwind of sex. So. And I do I do want to point out that I don't want to like lose the forest for the trees kinds of things because that I don't think this kind of education would prevent, you know, a Larry Nassar or a Jerry Sandusky situation. Um, those kind those are community based Problems and they have to. And so, one of the other things I think about too that um, might be important to this panel and this audience is the role of parents in all of this because um, parents are so uncomfortable talking to their children about sex. Um, and they might be a little bit more comfortable talking to them about sexual abuse prevention, but they don't, they can't imagine the ways in which it would come up. So, for example, like Sandusky, like Larry Nassar they might not even conceptualize them as perpetrators, so they might not even know. Should have I should I have asked my daughter what that exam was like or that procedure was like? I mean, even though it was medical, I mean, it seems like we should at least talk about that. There are many parents that said, like, it was a medical exam. It's like a, like the pap smear. I was just blown away that a parent would think that way. But, um... But they do, and they, they need help as well. Um, I know I've noticed, and even in my own situation, I give the example of um, um, you know, gun safety. I always thought, you know, when my kid was going to go um, start doing play dates without me there, I'd always ask them if there's a gun in the house. And I'm embarrassed to ask them if there's a gun in the house. Apparently, it's worse for me to offend somebody by thinking that they have a gun than it is for my kid to potentially get shot or to shoot somebody else in a house because we, you know, and I, so I think we have to also empower people to really be able to have the skills to really talk about these very uncomfortable subjects and to be able to say like, hey, I'm not sure about this coach or I'm not sure what this neighbors doing. Even though we've had like seven potlucks together, mm -hmm. I think we need to say something. Like as a group of friends or whatever, as parents, that's I think another part, piece of this that perhaps more is more relevant to um, you know, <coughs> certainly child sexual abuse <coughs> protection than maybe the college campus type of sexual misconduct. I just want to say that I echo that 100%. I agree with you 100%. I'd just like to make a point of clarification for the parents that we did not know what was going on with our daughters. Had anybody told us or even intimated that something was being inserted into our under 12 year old daughter's vagina, that would not be okay. So it was not like a pap smear. It was not a legitimate procedure. And I think we need to make that very clear to everybody. That this was not a treatment. It was not similar to anything else. And it was not okay. And it's not okay to call it a treatment. It was not medical in any way. 
and I think the young women who so courageously are sitting up there can justify that. Yeah, I, I perhaps need to clarify my comment as well. I, I do not think that it was, a, I'm not at all excusing what happened at all. I'm just, I'm just simply repeating what some parents have said. There are so many survivors of Nasser and so many parents who are beyond outraged and should be. Um, so I, I'm just saying that for some of them, a very small group of them, they felt that, it, that they were being lied to because it was, they, they were being told that it was a procedure. Was it a procedure? Of course not. And was it, I mean, likened to a pap smear? Of course not. Um, but I think that we, we have to be able to have parents feel empowered to talk about it, right? many parents who were not, did not feel empowered. And I think it's also the language um, and giving us the language to use. Um, I, I think of my own story and my, my mom was in the room. Um, she went to almost every appointment with me, um, brought me there. And I, I remember her sitting me down when um, the the news article broke, uh, broke with Rachel Dunn Hollander um, a couple years before the trial, and my mom sat me down and was like, did this, like, she was like, oh my God, like, what, what in the world, like, did this happen to you? And I couldn't tell her the truth. Um, I, I passed it off, and she told people that I was one of the lucky ones. That's what she told her friends for the longest time, so I think it's also, it, it, Figuring out a way to um, let people know that it's okay. Um, I, I couldn't tell her. I, like After I came forward, it was another like week or so before she knew. Um, and by this time, we were best friends. Like I told her everything. I didn't tell her that I came forward and talked to someone about this um, and, and joined this lawsuit. Um, a pretty big thing to hide. Um, and I can only hide it for so long. But I think it's also important to know, like, if I couldn't even talk about it years later, how was I supposed to talk about it like at the time and share that? So I think it's it's giving someone the language or the the information to to be able to share it. Maybe it's not even like, hey, I think this was sexual abuse. Maybe it's just like this felt funny, this felt odd, this felt different. Um, something that could have cued somebody else to kind of start that chain reaction. Um, would it, it have changed everything? Who knows? You know, there are plenty of people who came forward um, before Rachel did and um, weren't believed. So we know that story. Um, but at least it starts that conversation and it gives that, the survivor an opportunity to reach out because I didn't have the language to do so. So... It's difficult to tell your mom that, especially when my mom was in the room too. And, you know, already you feel terrible and broken and like what the heck just happened. But, I mean, if you think about it from a mother's standpoint, after I told my mom, you know, immediately some of that blame goes on them. And it's not their fault. It was not my mom's fault. It wasn't your mom's fault. It was nobody's mom's fault. But as a mother, you feel responsible for part of that, for your child hurting, for your child being hurt, especially when you were there in the room. So I think people need to understand as well that it's not, it's not easy to talk about in general, but especially with your parents and for them to be there and for them to immediately think why well, I, I could have done something um, I could have stopped this I could have you know I could have said something or why didn't I you know why didn't my mom radar go off or what and that opens up just a whole other aspect of 
you know, hurt and pain and blame that doesn't belong anywhere on moms or parents for that matter. Um, because it's not easy to talk about. And they are our biggest support systems, or at least for me, my mom is my biggest support system. And it was really difficult to watch her go through all of this as well as with me. So, obviously there aren't parenting classes for people really, like there's like how to care for an infant, but there's not like this is how you raise a child. So how would you suggest parents talk about talk about this to, your, to their children, or how do you even like encourage them to begin that conversation, or to educate themselves on how to talk about it? Kimberly, would you like to play in on this one? Um, you know, this, this is this is hard. This is a hard discussion to have with your kids. It depends on the age of your kids. It depends on what foundation you've laid down to talk to them about even, you know, what do they call their own genitalia, be able to refer to the parts you're talking about with regards to discussion. So, um, you know, how you go about and have these discussions is just, I think, <coughs> Having the, like, first and foremost, like, you have to, I think, be able to have this, say the words out loud, be able to talk about penis, vagina, and try and explain some of these pieces, it's it's not easy. Um, and I agree that, you know, one of the things that's, that's happening as a part of a lot of the prevention programming and the um, early childhood education is that there are components for parents to be able to go and have discussions around, okay, how do we have this discussion with our child? Um, because there's two sides, there's there's two ways this happens, right? You either are having a discussion with your child, or your child is disclosing to you something for the first time, and you didn't expect it, and you have no idea how to handle that disclosure. Um, and so, um, some of the, the programs and the different um, strategies that we have a lot of experts in the room that could probably talk better about it than I could, um, it, it really is a matter of believing what your child is bringing to you and, and when they feel that they can come to you. They, they do a lot of talking in, in these um, uh, strategies around, uh, just as we've already been talking about believing survivors, believing your child, um, and, and knowing that if they come to you and they say these things to you, they're not in trouble, that they didn't do anything wrong, that you're going to listen, and the questions that you ask back um, are not blaming back. And that can be really hard sometimes because sometimes it's not the words, it's the tone or um, uh, the, the context in which the discussion is happening. And so I think um, I'll definitely let my colleagues kind of share their thoughts to it, but those are the, those are the first things that, that come to my mind is, is uh, and, these, these are difficult conversations, but they have to happen. Can I add to the question? So, so I really am interested to hear what you experts think. So uh, as I told you all before, I have one daughter. And uh, one of the things I decided is that we were just going to talk about sex and bodies and I didn't care. And all of her young life, because uh, that was not the case in my house growing up, uh, my mother would say, yes. And I grew up on a farm. There was sex everywhere. So, <laughs> but, but it was interesting to me, the point that I wanted to curious about is, so until she was an adolescent, no big deal. We could talk about everything, no problem. But now, even though I still insist on talking, and I still insist on asking questions, and I still don't care, she's mortified if I even say anything. Right? So it really shifts as they change. And I think that's part of the challenge. So there you go. So two important points are made. So there's there's one, there's the prevention education conversations, right? But then there's also the response to a disclosure. And so the research shows, and I'm sure many survivors can attest to the fact that one of the number one um, factors that goes into um, a survivor of sexual violence healing is having their mother believe them. Um, that's huge, 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 huge. And so, um, and really feeling, knowing that she believes you, not just that, um, you know, she says she believes you or she knows that that was wrong, 
because it is it does feel like um, you know a certain um, protection has been lost in a certain way. So that that's a a, a relationship that has to work through that. Um, so being open and validating of anybody's experience. Um, is important, but a lot of times kids will not come to parents with their experiences because they they feel shame. Even if the parent themselves is open and not shaming, they, they see the shame in their friends, they see their friends, you know, don't want to share things, or they see how their parents react to sex on TV. Um, they see how their parents spell sex instead of saying it, so they don't want to make their parent feel bad. And for people who have survived sexual assault, disclosing that to a parent can also feel like hurting them in some way because you don't want to let them down. Um, but in terms of prevention, all, all we know is that we can talk early and often about body parts and naming them specifically um, by correct, you know, genital names. It's one thing that perpetrators do too. They'll pick um, child sexual potential child sexual abuse victims who use words like wee wee and hoo ha and stuff because they're not only are they less likely to tell but they're also harder cases to perpetrate because the kid won't be able to use the correct terminology in their own um, you know statement and so um, yeah I think being open you know from the beginning but that takes practice and support, and that's kind of what I was, the point I was trying to make before is not, this isn't just about educating young people, it's about educating parents, because it's not like parents have the language, or even the, um, a lot of times even the ability to, to override that sort of social desirability to inquire about something that might seem off. Okay, so I'm not a mom. I'm a cat mom, but I'm not a mom. And, uh, but I took um, Human Development and Family Studies 211 last year here at Michigan State. It's Child Growth and Development. Um, and we actually talked about sex education and how to teach your children um, you know, in an effective way. Um, and there's actually, we learned about something that they're doing over in China and they came out with these books, and they're kids' books, they're picture books, and they explain, you know, the your anatomy and your body parts and the names of everything. And there's different, I guess, there's different, not chapters. What's the, what's the, I can't think of the word. A series. It's a series of books. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, each different book is a different part of sex education and there's some on you know the very basics of your body parts and um, that it goes on to you know what's okay and what's not okay in terms of um, touching with other people or touching yourself and um, so I don't really I'm, I'm not a mom like I said I know that I will teach my kids about consent and sex education as soon as they're old enough to understand but, um, like you said, you know, they do reach that adolescent age, and I remember when I was a teenager and didn't want to talk to my mom about anything regarding anything sex-related. Um, so, but it was just something really interesting that I learned about and a different approach that they're taking over there to try to teach kids in a more effective way. Thanks, Kevin. This is highly relevant to us in the museum. We, our, our vision is that this wall here, that's now about Benin in West Africa, will be on consent, will be open to minors, and it will be obviously visible because we do get thousands of school children and families coming through. And we keep on wondering, you know, is it the tea example? Is it, you know, we, we've been playing around with hair pulling, but obviously nobody gives consent for their hair to be pulled, so should it be tickling? Although now after this discussion, we can see the argument for something, for, more, for, for developing more explicit vocabularies, although perhaps not on this wall, since there's no consent that 
families are giving to just come into the museum and immediately be confronted with. But we're just we're pondering all of that in terms of the kind of appropriate programming um, that, that also to give uh, parents and guardians the tools to decide whether or not they're going to walk through that door uh, with, uh, with with minors. Um, but I, I, I did want to circle around to this question that um, was on the table a few minutes ago around the question of parental responsibilities. Uh, because my, my understanding, and perhaps I'm missed, but in the hundreds of cases that I know of, I believe that the cases in which an individual was finally informed uh, that, that there had been physical penetration and then went on to somehow legitimate that as a quote medical treatment, that that was only done by quote unquote professionals, uh, either fellow health professionals or, or in a number of cases law enforcement individuals who believed certain claims or depositions. And uh, we worry a lot in the development of this exhibition about, about what seems to be a very persistent myth that almost every day we hear, whenever anybody uh, finds out that we're working on this exhibition, it, is that somebody will very quickly voice some assertion that if there was parental fault, uh, either because parents were excessively concerned with their child's success or, or engaged in, in sort of willful ignorance, for which there really is no evidence. But there are real questions about the failure of something about the way in which we're training professionals um, uh, to, to just believe, uh, to not believe survivors, uh, and not believe young women, and uh, whether or not they're psychologists or, uh, 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 in some cases, uh, you know, cl or other clinicians or, or, or law enforcement professionals. And I'm just wondering about that. Uh, maybe, Andrea, put you on the spot a little bit. What, what made it possible for one law enforcement professional not to go along with the consensus? Um, Andrea here? Andrea. Hi, Kim. Great. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> um, I'm Andrea Monfort. I'm with the Energy Police Department. Um, the foundation for me was really Dr. Rebecca Campbell's teaching on the neurobiology of trauma. Um, and some other people like Tom Tremblay, and Russell Strand, and I think the really important starting point for law enforcement, for prosecutors, um, is really having that firm foundation of trauma. So when someone presents, we understand what those signs are. We understand that it's not somebody lying, that it's not somebody who um, is trying to get revenge against somebody, that those are symptoms, those are signs, those are things of trauma that they're presenting, and it changes the way you do an investigation. Because then you understand, and you can help explain to them that what you're feeling is a normal sign of trauma, and then they realize that you believe them. Um, there's a wonderful campaign called Start by Believing that's through End Violence Against Women International. Um, if no one is familiar with that, EVA, E B A W I, the website is fantastic. They have a conference every year. Um, they actually have an online training institute for law enforcement and some other disciplines as well. Um, to teach on all of these topics, they stay current and best practice. And that's something that we need to encourage all of our law enforcement to do. Some of that comes from funding. So any of you that are in municipal manager positions or know of people that are, encourage those people to fund their police departments to go through this training. Because until we have that foundation, we're going to keep making these mistakes. We're going to turn survivors away. We may believe them, but we may also turn them away without support. And we have to be able to provide them with support, with the resources that they need, so that this process, which is a really horrible, painful process anyway, they can have support while they're doing that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards, too, about certain resources that people need. The other thing I want to talk about of being a parent, you know, I'm a parent, my kids are teenagers, and, and I started some conversations really early. In fact, my son just turned 18, and he's leaving for the Navy this summer, and I brought something up, and he said, Mom, you've been talking to me about this since I was 12. I really get it. I'm like, well, good, because we're still going to talk about it. We're <laughs> property of the U.S. military. Um, but in terms of parenting, trust your instincts. We talk ourselves out of that so much because we want to believe the good in people. And I'm not saying to fear everybody or to think that everybody has bad motives. That's not the case, but trust 
your instincts. Ask questions. Watch for people as they're pushing boundaries. Learn what grooming looks like. Not just as parents, this is something that we all need to do. I mean, we saw some of the institutional failures of people that were told. They were groomed. Everybody was groomed. When we start looking at those things, we start asking those questions, we start realizing that there needs to be boundaries with relationships. Doctors even, we always teach our kids, you know. No one can see those private parts except mommy, daddy, and the doctor. No. The child needs to own those parts. There's some awareness that we have to teach them as parents, but they always have the right to say when somebody is doing something wrong or to question when someone is doing something wrong. So us trusting in our instincts teaches them to trust theirs as well. I'd like to take one more question, then I'll have an opportunity for a final thought, so. So I. <laughs> Thanks. Dr. Moss, I've been thinking about what you said about how um, the United States compared to other Western countries, well, yeah, relatively seems more violent than other ones, and you were, you were theorizing, theorizing about what that might be. Um, I'm a communications major, and we study a lot of media effects, and one thing we uh, learned was that in the United, the United States, it's is much more likely to censor sexual content in the media, and then in Western Europe, it's you, they're much more likely to censor violence that's permissible in the U.S. So I'm wondering, um, in, in Western Europe, when, when there's a more, like, um, body, uh, yeah, when there's more body positivity and, like, sex positivity, and these things aren't associated with guilt and shame, um, are there, are there different, uh, or do we know if, that helps prevent sexual violence and sexual assault in the way that, like when you're, or yeah, we know that they have better um, sex education, so their abortion rates are lower, their STD rates are lower. Is there less sexual violence also because of that? Yeah, statistically there is, um, and uh, a colleague of mine actually does uh, work trying to implement some of the Netherlands um, education because there, um, a lot of the adolescents there are like blown away that you would even need consent education um, just because of how they're sort of brought up with this uh, lifespan approach to, to sex education. Um, which I think can de I mean, anything that's going to destigmatize is going to make, um, you know, perpetrators are going to have a harder job. Parents are going to be more um, empowered. You know, anytime there's less shame, I think it's better because because of the shame, we tend to hide these kinds of things even more. Um, so that might be part of it, but I mean, it's hard to to say what actually causes that. But. Sure, it doesn't hurt. So um, I'd like to give all of our panelists an opportunity to just kind of give a, a final thought on um, the topic for tonight. So um, as, unless Dr. Austin is going to steal the mic from me. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, everybody now. I would just like to encourage people to, to talk and to seek help whenever needed, um, and whether that's with a close person or a professional um, in this area, that I hope um, our conversation tonight can inspire you to have conversations with people you care about. I think I'd echo that. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming uh, and actually having this conversation because I think it's complex. It's difficult to talk about. Um, it's still <coughs> stigmatized in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think um, kind of opening up and um, sharing that with um, and, and then listening. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for coming and doing that. Um, yeah, I want to thank you all for coming as well, and um, just to echo what both of them said. Um, but I would like to be a nerd for a second. Um, 
So I'm a neuroscience major and uh, I attended Dr. Campbell's um, Understanding Trauma workshop last fall and not only was it extremely educational, it was very healing in the same sense. Um, I'll just give you guys a little bit of information. Um, during a sexual assault, the, there are two systems in, um, there's the sympathetic ner nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, and sympathetic is fight or flight or freeze, which is something that that third F, the freeze, usually isn't really talked about, um, and then parasympathetic is rest and digest. But when you are um, being assaulted, the sympathetic nervous system takes place, and a lot of times, um, you'll hear from survivors, or maybe if you you are a survivor yourself and you've felt this kind of paralysis, this like freeze. Um, during that assault, your brain is perceiving this as a life or death situation, and sometimes freezing is the only way that you can stay alive. And your prefrontal cortex, which is involved, it's like right up here, it's involved in all executive functioning, all like logical thinking. Um, completely shuts down, and your fear axis, which is the hypothalamus, amygdala, and pituitary gland, I believe, takes over, and um, so no one will ever be able to remember every detail of an assault, and I think it's really important that if you don't know a lot about trauma, to go educate yourself on trauma, like Andrea was saying. Um, it's very healing to understand how it works, and um, it's very important, I think, to be able to communicate with survivors and people that you know might not have come forward yet but are struggling, and to recognize the signs of trauma and get and give help. So, but thank you all for coming. Sorry to be interrupted. <laughs> Really, I just want to thank the museum for taking the time and for all of the Army of Survivors and others who've taken the time to think about how we can continue the conversation. Because it's tiring to have the conversation or to think about having the conversation. Uh, but then it's fun. I think it's great to hear what you all are thinking about and worrying about, to listen to the last uh, video online and then to hear what people are saying. I think it's a really important thing and it's a constructive uh, way to um, deal with the trauma of uh, living on this university plan sometimes. So, uh, thank you. So I'm in the last place, so I don't have much to add either other than, um, I, again, thank everybody for being here and part of this discussion. And I also want to encourage everybody to, you know, if you have a friend or a family member or a colleague you know, talk about what you went and did last night and, and see what kind of conversations you can start. And it's about having these conversations and then taking them outside of places like this and continuing to have the conversation and continuing to spread the word. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you guys to do that. And, um, yeah, I think this, the fact that the museum is doing, you know, took this on is, is great. And I want to thank the Army of Survivors, you guys. I'm so bummed to not have been able to meet you in person tonight because I've heard so much about each and every one of you and um, and just in awe of your strength and your bravery. And I want to thank you guys for being here tonight with me. Um, I haven't been able to see you. I've been, thanks for much. I'm staring at the audience all day. So you guys have had to stare at my face staring back at you. Um, but again, thank you guys. And I think this is an important discussion. So um, I was very honored to be a part of it. Thank you. So I just want to say a quick word on behalf of the museum. First of all, thanks to our, our remarkable panelists and to our extremely skilled, the Tom Fritz, our extremely skilled moderator. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> and thanks really to, to all of you for being here. Your, your presence, your intellectual engagement, your, your emotional integrity of these discussions is what makes all of this possible. We're all on a very complex journey. Together I want to acknowledge uh, the members, all the members of the Survivor and Allies Advisory Committee that's guiding this exhibition. Valerie uh, Trank is, is here right up on the steps, who has been with us from the very first moment through this very difficult journey that we're going through. It's, I think for all of us, uh, at least in the museum world, and I, and I think for the survivor, many, many of the survivors and allies, one of the hardest things we've ever done to do an exhibition that's serious and that grapples 
with these enormously, endlessly painful issues, um, but with seriousness, seriousness and integrity, and for our panelists to have been part of that, it's just extraordinary, it's breathtaking. So just to keep you mindful of a few dates that will be helpful in this continuing journey of ours, a week from tomorrow night, we're going to continue the conversation in Detroit, at the MSU Detroit Center on Woodward Avenue. I mean, as Megan has mentioned, I think everybody's brought up, uh, uh, in one way or another, uh, a sort of critical engagement of issues of privilege, especially around race-based privilege and class-based privilege, as well as issues of xenophobia and homophobia and so forth. But we're really going to concentrate uh, a week from tomorrow night on Wednesday on the que questions of racialized sexual violence and of understanding the struggle uh, 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 to prevent and work through issues around sexual violence and patriarchy uh, through a racial justice lens. And it's going to be an extraordinary conversation. I urge everybody who happens to be in the Detroit area uh, to come again. We'll video uh, that as well. We'll then gather March 12th again for a conversation around journalism. Judy Walgard will be part of that, really the politics both of images, of print, of broadcast coverage. Um, in what ways, what were the, the great heroic uh, uh, aspects of journalistic coverage, and what have been the failures uh, in terms of the continued objectification, especially of, of, of girls and women, uh, what's been lost uh, along the way, but what's also been gained. It's going to be a really fascinating conversation. We will open the exhibition officially on Tuesday, April 16th, so the exhibition will be both primarily in this gallery, but also there'll be upstairs components with a really extraordinary large work of art that's created by uh, survivor artists. So survivor art and poetry will be important. And then we'll gather to wrap this up, this semester up, April 23rd, which is a Tuesday, with a conversation here about uh, art and ceremony and healing. I mean, art is, um, in the end of the day, perhaps uh, the single greatest gift that we have to fight against the darkness. And we will then go upstairs to a joyous celebration of Sister Survivors. This is another event organized with the Army of Survivors. Uh, a poetry slam, a spoken word event, in which there'll be many voices celebrating uh, the extraordinary uh, bravery and courage and resilience of the Sister Survivors and honoring survivors everywhere. So that will be this semester. We're looking for your ideas and your thoughts. The exhibition will be open for a year. Uh, and we hope it will be an integral part of the campus and one part of this puzzle of trying to restore this campus, which was the scene of the crime in so many respects, but to make it a generative space uh, for uh, the wider transformation uh, and the rehumanizing of higher education throughout this country, but also uh, a big part of the central to this global struggle uh, for human dignity uh, and for decency. And as uh, President Lipta said in his beautiful letter today, this being the anniversary of Founders Day, uh, for a return to civility and kindness and compassion, which has been so sorely lacking here. So thank you to these wonderful voices uh, in Detroit and, uh, and right here uh, for uh, opening up that pathway for us. Thanks.